Section 16 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 37. Regency of Mary de' Medici, 1610-1617, Part 1. On the death of Henry the Fourth, there was extreme disquietude as well as grief in France. To judge by appearances, however, there was nothing to justify excessive alarm. The Edict of Nantes, April 13, 1598, had put an end, so far as the French were concerned, to religious wars. The Treaty of Vervins, May the 2nd, 1598, between France and Spain, the Twelve Years' Truce between Spain and the United Provinces, April 9, 1609, the death of Philip II, September 13, 1598, and the alliance between France and England seemed to have brought peace to Europe. It might have been thought that there remained no more than secondary questions, such as the possession of the Marquisate of Saluzzo and the succession to the duchies of Cleves and Juliet but the instinct of peoples sees further than the negotiations of diplomats. In the public estimation of Europe, Henry the Fourth was a representative of, and the security for order, peace, national and equitable policy, intelligent and practical ideas. So thought Sully, when at the king's death he went equally alarmed and disconsolate, and shut himself up in the arsenal, and the people had grounds for being of Sully's opinion. Public confidence was concentrated upon the king's personality spectators pardoned almost with a smile those tender foibles of his which nevertheless his proximity to old age rendered still more shocking they were pleased at the clear-sighted and strict attention he paid to the education of his son louis the dauphin to whose governess madame de monglat he wrote quote, i am vexed with you for not having sent me word that you have whipped my son for i do wish and command you to whip him every time he shows obstinacy in anything wrong knowing well by my own case that there is nothing in the world that does more good than that and to mary medici herself he added quote, of one thing i do assure you and that is that being of the temper i know you to be of and foreseeing that of your son you stubborn not to say headstrong madame and he obstinate you will verily have many a tussle together henry the fourth saw as clearly into his wife's as into his son's character persons who were best acquainted with the disposition of mary de medici and were her most indulgent critics said of her in sixteen ten when she was now thirty-seven years of age quote, that she was courageous haughty firm discreet vain obstinate vindictive and mistrustful inclined to idleness caring but little about affairs and fond of royalty for nothing beyond its pomp and its honours henry had no liking for her or confidence in her and in private had frequent quarrels with her yet nevertheless had her coronation solemnized and had provided by anticipation for the necessities of government on the king's death and at the imperious instance of the duke of epernon who at once introduced the queen and said in open session as he exhibited his sword quote, it is as yet in the scabbard but it will have to leap therefrom unless this moment there be granted to the queen a title which is her due according to the order of nature and of justice End quote. the parliament forthwith declared mary regent of the kingdom thanks to sully's firm administration there were after the ordinary annual expenses were paid at that time in the vaults of the bastille or in securities easily realizable forty one million three hundred and forty five thousand livres and there was nothing to suggest that extraordinary and urgent expenses would come to curtail this substantial reserve the army was disbanded and reduced to from twelve to fifteen thousand men french or swiss for a long time past no power in france had at its accession possessed so much material strength and so much moral authority but mary de medici had in her household and in her court the wherewithal to rapidly dissipate this double treasure in sixteen hundred at the time of her marriage she had brought from florence to paris her nurse's daughter leonora galliguet and leonora's husband concino concini son of a florentine notary both of them full of coarse ambition covetous vain and determined to make the best of their new position so as to enrich themselves and exalt themselves beyond measure and at any price mary gave them in that respect all the facilities they could possibly desire they were her confidants her favourites and her instruments as regarded both her own affairs and theirs 
these private and subordinate servants were before long joined by great lords court folks ambitious and vain likewise egotists mischief-makers whom the strong and able hand of henry the fourth had kept aloof but who at his death returned upon the scene thinking of nothing whatever but their own fortunes and their rivalries they shall just be named here pell-mell whether members or relatives of the royal family or merely great lords the conde the conti the enghien the dukes of epernon guise elbeuf mayenne bouillon and nevers great names and petty characters encountered at every step under the regency of mary de medici and with their following forming about her a court hive equally restless and useless time does justice to some few men and executes justice on the ruck one must have been of great worth indeed to deserve not to be forgotten sully appeared once more at court after his momentary retreat to the arsenal but in spite of the show of favor which mary de medici thought it prudent and decent to preserve towards him for some little time he soon saw that it was no longer the place for him and that he was of as little use there to the state as to himself he sent in one after the other his resignation of all his important offices and terminated his life in regular retirement at rosny and sully sur loire du plessis mornay attempted to still exercise a salutary influence over his party Quote, let there be no more talk amongst us said he of huguenot or papists those words are prohibited by our edicts and though there were no edict at all still if we are french if we love our country our families and even ourselves they ought henceforth to be wiped out of our remembrance whoso is a good frenchman shall to me be a citizen shall to me be a brother End quote. This meritorious and patriotic language was not entirely without moral effect, but it no longer guided, no longer inspired the government. Egotism, intrigue, and mediocrity in ideas as well as in feelings had taken the place of Henry the Fourth. Facts, before long, made evident the sad result of this. All the parties, all the personages who walked the stage and considered themselves of some account, believed that the moment had arrived for pushing their pretensions, and lost no time about putting them forward those persons we will just pass in review without stopping at any one of them history has no room for all those who throng about her gates without succeeding in getting in and leaving traces of their stay the reformers were the party to which the reign of henry the fourth had brought most conquests and which was bound to strive above everything to secure the possession of them by extracting from them every legitimate and practicable consequence mary de medici having been declared regent lost no time about confirming on the twenty second of may sixteen ten the edict of nantes and proclaiming religious peace as the due of france Quote, we have nothing to do with the quarrels of the grandees said the people of paris we have no mind to be mixed up with them End quote. some of the preachers of repute and of the party's old leaders used the same language quote, there must be naught but a scarf any longer between us du plessis mornay would say two great protestant names were still intact at this epoch one the duke of sully without engaging in religious polemics had persisted in abiding by the faith of his fathers in spite of his king's example and attempts to bring him over to the catholic faith the other du plessis mornay had always striven and was continuing to strive actively for the protestant cause these two illustrious champions of the reformed party were in agreement with the new principles of national right and with the intelligent instincts of their people whose confidence they deserved and seemed to possess but the passions the usages and the suspicions of the party were not slow in reappearing the protestants were highly displeased to see the catholic worship and practices re-established in berne whence queen jeanne of navarre had banished them the rights of religious liberty were not yet powerful enough with them to surmount their taste for exclusive domination as a guarantee for their safety they had been put in possession of several strong places in france neither the edict of nantes nor its confirmation by mary de medici appeared to them a sufficient substitute for this guarantee and they claimed its continuance which was granted them for five years after henry the fourth's conversion to catholicism his european policy had no longer been essentially protestant he had thrown out feelers and entered into negotiations for catholic alliances and these when the king's own liberal and patriotic spirit was no longer there to see that they did not sway his government became objects of great suspicion and antipathy to the protestants henry had constantly and to good purpose striven against the spirit of religious faction and civil war 
anxious after his death about their liberty and their political importance the reformers reassumed a blind confidence in their own strength and a hope of forming a small special state in the midst of the great national state their provincial assemblies and their national synods were from sixteen eleven to sixteen twenty one effective promoters of this tendency which before long became a formal and organized design at saumur at tonnein at privas at grenoble at loudun at la rochelle the language the movements and the acts of the party took more and more the character of armed resistance and ere long of civil war the leaders old and new duke henry of rohan as well as the duke of bouillon the marquis of la force as well as the duke of lesdiguieres more or less timidly urged on the zealous protestants in that path from which the ancient councils of sully and mornay were not successful in deterring them on the tenth of may sixteen twenty one in the assembly of la rochelle a commission of nine members was charged to present and get adopted a plan of military organization whereby protestant france warren included was divided into eight circles having each a special council composed of three deputies at the general assembly under a chief who had the disposal of all the military forces with each army corps there was a minister to preach the royal monies talliages aid and gable were to be seized for the wants of the army the property of the catholic church was confiscated and the revenues therefrom appropriated to the expenses of war and the pay of the ministers of the religion it was a protestant republic organized on the model of the united provinces and disposed to act as regarded the french kingship with a large measure of independence when after thus preparing for war they came to actually make it the protestants soon discovered their impotence the duke of bouillon sixty-five years of age and crippled with gout interceded for them in his letters to louis the thirteenth but did not go out of sedan the duke of lesdiguieres to whom the assembly had given the command of the protestants of burgundy provence and dauphiny was at that very moment on the point of abjuring their faith and marching with their enemies duke henry of rohan himself who was the youngest and seemed to be the most ardent of their new chiefs was for doing nothing and breaking up Quote, if you are not disposed to support the assembly said the marquis of chateauneuf who had been sent to him to bring him to a decision it will be quite able to defend itself without you End quote. Quote, if the assembly said rohan feeling his honour touched does take resolutions contrary to my advice i shall not sever myself from the interest of our churches End quote. and he sacrificed his better judgment to the popular blindness the dukes of la tremoille and of soubise and the marquises of la force and of chatillon followed suit as m de sismondi says to these five lords and to a small number of towns was the strength reduced of the party which was defying the king of france thus since the death of henry the fourth the king and court of france were much changed the great questions and the great personages had disappeared the last of the real chiefs of the league the brother of duke henry of guise the old duke of mayenne he on whom henry in the hour of victory would wreck no heavier vengeance than to walk him to a standstill was dead henry the fourth's first wife the sprightly and too facile marguerite de valois was dead also after consenting to descend from the throne in order to make way for the mediocre mary de medici the catholic champion whom henry the fourth felicitated himself upon being able to oppose to duplessis mornay in the polemical conferences between the two communions cardinal de perron was at the point of death the decay was general and the same amongst the protestants as amongst the catholics sully and mornay held themselves aloof or were barely listened to in place of these eminent personages had come intriguing or ambitious subordinates who were either innocent of or indifferent to anything like a great policy and who had no idea beyond themselves and their fortunes the husband of leonora galliguet concini had amassed a great deal of money and purchased the marquisate of ancre nay more he had been created marshal of france and he said to the count of bassompierre quote, i have learned to know the world and i am aware that a man when he has arrived at a certain pitch of prosperity comes down with a greater run the higher he has mounted when i came to france i was not worth a son and i owed more than eight thousand crowns my marriage in the queen's kind favour has given me much advancement office and honour i have worked at making my fortune and i pushed it forward as long as i saw the wind favourable so soon as i felt it turning i thought about beating a retreat and enjoying in peace the large property we have acquired it is my wife who is opposed to this desire at every crack of the whip we receive from fortune i continue to urge her 
God knows whether warnings have been wanting. My daughter's death is the last, and if we do not heed it, our downfall is at hand. End quote. Then he quietly made out an abstract of all his property, amounting to eight millions, with which he purposed to buy from the Pope the usufruct of the Duchy of Ferrara, and leave his son, besides, a fine inheritance. But his wife continued her opposition. It would be cowardly and ungrateful, she said, to abandon the Queen. Quote, so that cried he i see myself ruined without any help for it and if it were not that i am under so much obligation to my wife i would leave her and go some whither where neither grandees nor common folk would come to look after me End quote. End of section sixteen